Richard, Richard Broadhurst, tricky on the forums. Um, you may wonder why I'm talking about the, how I make the games for the BBC Micro, as in what games has he made anyway? Um, well, not in chronological order, but I've written Astro Blaster for the BBC Micro, Carnival, Centipede, Frogger, Phoenix, which technically isn't quite finished, but I don't think there'll be any more to it. Scramble, Space Invaders, and then I've also written a couple of emulators uh, kind of inspired by MAME for the arcade game Circus, Ripcord, Sprint, and Warlords. And I'm currently working on a, a remake of Moon Patrol for the BBC Micro. I'll share some slides. So I guess the other question is why is my why is my nickname on the forums tricky? Uh, it's because I like doing the tricky bits. I don't really like writing the games. I don't like doing the game over. I'm not even a big game player, but I do like writing tricky bits of code. And the best excuse you get for that is writing game software, uh, which was also why I was a games developer for 15 years. So um, I'm going to use Carnival as, a, as an example of how I make a game. It's a Sega Gremlin arcade game from 1980. Uh, it was the first modern remake that I did, uh, and I loved it as a teenager. Annoying music and all. Um, why do I choose a game? Well, I'll, I'll cover what it needs for me to pick it as a game that I'm going to do. And then the, uh, the process that I go through in making a game and the tools that I use to do it. And finally, um, what happens when I get sidetracked, um, often caused by Arcadian. So why do I choose, uh, <laughs> why do I choose a game? Well, usually because I think of a new idea or at least new to me technique for how I can make a game that hasn't been made or hasn't been made very well on the BBC. Or maybe it's just a technique that wasn't thought of back in the day and it was needed to make the game um, like the arcade. So for Carnival, uh, you've got the three rows of targets that you're shooting. That's 42 sprites that are all eight by 16 pixels, which is a lot more than you generally see in any BBC game. Uh, they move at one pixel, um, so they look nice and smooth. Uh, and I redraw them at 50 frames a second, although the arcade doesn't actually do that because they don't move quite that fast. And I think the arcade game is actually character mapped, so each one is actually four characters. Uh, yeah, so I only have um, so much motivation for writing a game once I've done the tricky bits. Uh, and then after that, it's really, it's really hard to stay motivated. So as Arcadian mentioned earlier, it's really great on the forums when you can get some feedback on a game, shows people are interested in it, and actually makes you think there might be some point to finishing it. I don't want to sound too down about it because I really do like writing the hard bits. But then after that, there's, you know, uh, what happens when you run out of bullets and you lose a life or it's game over, you know, entering a high school table. These things don't really thrill me. And the more games I do, the more times writing that same code becomes less exciting. So uh, it's really great to get that, get that feedback. And it really helps if I actually like the game that I'm writing, because then that gives me a bit more motivation to finish it. And so some of the feedback that I get from the shows that I take my machines and my games to is that often my games, people say they don't really look like a BBC game. I'll cover a bit more about that later. Um, but so, well, we had Carousel on the BBC Micro. So what was wrong with Carousel? Well, because it was one of my favorite games and I used to run a small arcade at the time, I used to play quite a lot of it. And the Acorn Soft game, although it has most of the um, most of the features of the arcade game, the targets don't move 
as you'd expect and the bullets don't move at the split the right speed so it, the targets look very fast and jerky and the bullets look very slow um it's got a nice tune um and it's it's definitely you know it, it, it it's recognizable as the game even down to having the little music symbol that you can shoot to turn the turn the tune off but yeah i was very disappointed back in the day and ever since then i've kind of really wanted to rewrite it and um so thinking about how i can draw all those sprites was the thing that made me think yes i, I can rewrite it now uh and then well back then it was retro software not uh, not stardot that was encouraging me so that was um that was what made me come back to to do carnival helped by finding um bbasm which is an excellent assembler for the bbc micro so when i um when I go to write a game, this is going to be quite a short talk. <laughs> when uh, when I write a game, I tend to take a copy of the previous game, or in Carnival's case, really just write the tech demo and then start tagging on, tacking on bits of games to it. So I take the previous game's code, delete anything that was specific for the previous game, uh, add the tricky bit that I or the new technique that I've thought of new to me that is i'm sure somebody else has already thought of it somewhere else and then i start adding gameplay uh, at least this is what i used to is what i did with carnival then i go and play the game in main and tweak what i've written what i've written to um match up to the actual gameplay although uh as i've discovered sometimes my memory is really not very good so the game that I've written is really not the arcade game that it should have been. So now I've swapped those first two steps over. So I'll go and play the game in name and make sure that the game I'm writing is actually the right game because it's a pain going back and having to change things, particularly if it changes the timing or means you can't use a technique that you thought you were going to be able to use. So I get the... Um, A lot of what makes these games so familiar is the movement of the uh, aliens, usually the characters, the the players, um, and the graphics. Most early arcade games use uh, either 224 by 256 or 256 by 224, which uh, works really well on the BBC because you, the screen layout, the screen memory fits nicely into two pages across um, for 256. Uh, so you can generally make the, set, the screen 256 by 256 and don't use part of it or 256 by 224 and save some memory as well. Uh, so I get the, uh, the movement patterns. I mean, for, for something like Carnival, the movement patterns are fairly simple. The first row moves across left to right, the second row right to left, third row left to right again. Um, there's a few things, like there's little bonus boxes that give you extra bullets with 5 and 10 written on them. And after they've gone across and come back, they don't go on the third row, uh, which I'd forgotten from back in the day, and only by watching the video did I notice that. So I'll play the game in name uh, and make a video of it or I'll disassemble the game and see if I can find where the data is for the movements of the various things. I've only done that with uh, Astro Blaster, the rest of the games. So I kind of made up my own thing or read something on the internet about how, you know, the rules of movement. Um, mostly I just make it so that it feels the same as playing name and, and call it done. To um, get the actual graphics themselves, because we're running at the same resolution as the arcade game, there's no reason why we can't use the same graphics as the original arcade game. Well, apart from copyright, obviously, that uh, that might have uh, might say you can't use the original graphics. Um, and what I find is that if I use, if I 
make a video in MAME or even video an emulator, capture an emulator playing a game. Uh, then I use virtual dub to edit that video or frame advance it a frame at a time and make notes of the movement of various um, actors within the game. Or sometimes with like with scramble, I'll actually write a tool. So I'll export the frames of the video and then write a tool that will track the movement of a given um, alien enemy spaceship, whatever, across from frame to frame to frame and make uh, and record the path that that alien has taken and then encode that as data so that I can use it in my game. I did that with the little uh, spaceships that move in a kind of figure eight pattern in, in Scramble. Uh, it turns out they've actually got a couple of little wobbles in their path that they follow. That looks like it's probably a bug. So you, if you notice, if you play my scramble, you'll notice the spaceship moves in a in what looks like a much smoother figure of eight than the arcade game, which actually makes it easier to avoid. So I'm now thinking that maybe that wasn't a bug. Maybe it was a deliberate uh, thing to try and make the aliens a little bit harder to get past that level. So from that video, I can either capture a frame and cut out the the various sprites which I'll use PaintShop Pro to do or as I said write them out and then um, then track the movement of the various elements of the game. For actually um, for actually building the game itself I use uh, well a very simple batch file really it's, uh, it's basically a four line batch file and for editing I use Visual Studio uh, fortunately, Visual Studio has a type of project called an NMake project, which actually has nothing to do with NMake whatsoever. It's just a project that lets you specify a command line to run for when you want to do the build process. Um, and so I'll also set up um, Visual Studio so that when I run the game, it actually uh, launches either B BM or BBEM. It's just those are the two emulators that I've hacked about the most to do what I want and show me information that I want to see. So I'll make build, call my batch file. The batch file will run BBASM. I'll go through that in a minute. Um, so I'll be, I'll, if I do a rebuild, I'll list the assembler. And if I just do a build, it'll just do the assembly. But not list the assembler. Uh, just do that because sometimes you want to look at the addresses or see which bit of code is at a particular address. Um, I've also written um, a couple of converters which have now really all gone into one converter uh, which will take the TGAs that I write out of PaintShop Pro, or that I've uh, automatically cropped by some process for processing the TGA files out of um, that have been written out from Virtual Dub. Um, they'll convert the sprites either into just simple ones that match the screen layout of the BBC, which I'll use for doing status areas of the screen, or sprites that only move horizontally. Um, they'll also write out four versions of the sprite for the four pixel positions within a byte if it's horizontally moving in pixels. For um, vertical, vertically moving sprites, I'll usually draw them, uh, I'll unroll the loop and draw a scan line at a time. Um, and because the, as they're moving vertically, you cross the eight bytes in a character row at different places, I'll actually store the sprites in columns rather than rows or rather than eight high chunks so that I can start at any point through them and loop over where I am in the column with the X register and where I am on the screen within the character on the Y register and say unrolled so that each column is drawn in parallel. And then when I get to the, when the Y register gets to the 
edge of a character, which I'll normally do by drawing from the bottom up so that when it goes below zero and becomes negative, I finish that character row and it's time to start on the one above. When X goes, med no, goes negative, then I finish drawing the sprite. Um, and so that kind of leaves how I keep myself motivated. So, as I said before, the um, originally Retro Software and now Stardot are probably the biggest motivators outside of me wanting to finish the game myself. And say so my enthusiasm tails off as soon as I've done the hard bit. So it's it's really great when I'll post up a demo or even just a, a screenshot and get some feedback on the forums saying, oh, that's looking great, keep going. Even just that might be enough to make, you know, get me to do another couple of sessions that week. Um, there's been one or two of the games where we've had a high score, a little mini high score challenge, which has been really good, apart from it's also really good at finding bugs. Um, so that can be a little bit uh, <laughs> a little bit disheartening as well as, um, but at least it gets me back into working on the game and, and that's great. Uh, Certainly with Carnival, um, Arcadian uh, has been one of the uh, most motivating people, I would say. And for Carnival particularly, he did a video of him playing Carnival in one of his arcade cabs. And that really spurred me on to, um, to finish the game so that it would be running in an arcade cab. Uh, unfortunately, it also sidetracked me a little bit because I thought, oh, well, there's main cabs, um, and at the time, BBC was not very well supported in main because this is, well, a lot of years ago now. I don't know, maybe eight, I'm not sure. Um, so I thought, oh, well, what? If you've got a machine in there running main, you could also make it so that it will boot the BBC emulators. So if we had a front end for that, that would run the game a bit like um, uh, bbcmicro.co.uk now, um, but only for launching the games, not for telling you anything about it. Uh, that would be great. So for a couple of weeks, I got sidetracked and I wrote a little Windows-based launcher for um, all the games. This must have been the early days of um, BBC Micro, or I might have... Yeah, I think it probably was. I'd have to check. Oh, yeah, 2015. So I don't know. Maybe it was, maybe it was from Stairway to Hell. I'm not sure. I can't remember where I got the screenshots from either now. Um, so this will launch either BM or BBEM. Uh, back then it had to pick one or the other for some games because the sound was broken on in some games on some emulators and the screen was broken in other games and other emulators. Uh, so I also um, added through direct input support, which is the way you read joysticks in Windows as part of the DirectX, so basically for games programming, uh, because the SDL that they were using didn't support two fire buttons on a joystick. Uh, and the game that I was working on at the time, I think it was Astro Blaster, which has a, a fire and warp button. So I really wanted two, two fire buttons in game. Um, so this also led to another site, another little diversion where I added additional joystick support where it actually maps the joystick to fire buttons, uh, sorry, the joystick and fire buttons to keys on the BBC Micro keyboard. So that all of the games that didn't support joystick could still be supported on this joystick. Uh, and also I did ways for the emulators to be quit by various key presses. And then another way to map the joystick and fire buttons to those key presses. Uh, so each, each game is launched with the name of a config file uh, or none if it's just going to use the joystick, if it supports joystick natively. That, that config file tells you, well, normally it would show at the bottom of the screen what you've mapped, which keys have been mapped to which buttons as part of the process. Um, and you can also navigate the, the launcher with just the joystick and buttons. Um, I've not done anything with it. I don't even think I posted the source 
for it anywhere. And I might get back to it another time. Um, but that's just one of the ways that I side managed to sidetrack myself quite well. So the build process that I actually use then, um, so this is my kind of four line batch file, is first to run BBASM, which is Rich Talbot Watkins uh, BBC assembler that's very much like the assembler built into BBC Basic. And I use it to assemble the game. Um, obviously pulls in all the uh, resources, all the converted sprites and graphics and sound and tunes and whatever text lumps them together uh, and writes out the game. At the same time, the, the one line file captures the load length and run addresses from from that uh, from that assembly. I'd probably call it compilation by mistake, but from that assembly. Um, then the second line basically is a call to my compressor, which I have put the source code up on on Stardot, which originally was for one of the games that uh, somebody asked, could it be made into a ROM? Maybe Arcadian again, I don't know. Um, but anyway, since then, and I've actually gone back and done it to the others, uh, I compress all of my games so they all fit into 16K. Um, uh, this has a, a benefit of also making them load a little bit quicker. The compressor isn't isn't great at compressing, but it takes like a 20K game and compresses it into about 14, 15K. Um, so it loads a little bit faster if you're using a GoTech or a floppy. Um, the decompressor is only about 80 bytes and it needs one or two bytes usually at the end of the data to um, a scratch base. Uh, so my third line runs another little tool that I've written which creates a basic file, a basic text file. Uh, it does this from a config file and this is to produce the uh, screens that you can see here. Um, this was for, uh, again, Arcadian, um, wanting this tricky soft uh, label for the retro software um, games to kind of bring them all together in a, in a single family stroke marketing thing. I'm sure you can explain that better than me. Um, but it does give them all a nice consistent front end to the game and is very reminiscent of the Acorn Soft logo. Uh, but because I got a bit fed up with trying to line up instructions and keys to press and um, and the, even the name in the middle of the tricky soft logos, I just wrote a little program that generates the basic code to draw these screens. Uh, and then it launches the game and there's a few bits of config in the file that specify how that works as well. Basically, it's a very simple file and it looks a bit like you see on screen there's a name and then there's a number of lines that say key this description key this description key this description then there's some um like text in this case shoot targets text shoot the bear and then uh another set of labels for the last three lines of text so you can have oh uh, was it up to about six lines of keys and then up to three lines of shoot the target, shoot the bear, and the three lines in, at the bottom, but they could equally be one, two, whatever. Uh, so it just spaces those out, hopefully in a pleasing way, but still making them look uh, consistent. Uh, and then the final process is to combine a ROM header, which I was kind of alluding to earlier, um, with the main compressed version of the game, uh, some initialization code that happens before the decompression, um, the basic file is also put on, this is all used to create a disk image, and the basic file is also pulled into BBASM, which can convert basic into a basic program on disk. Uh, in this case, the loader. So that what you get out is a single, is a loader file in basic, a pling boot file to launch the loader, 
and uh, a game that is uh, in all current games are under 16k with a ROM header. So you can actually load them as a sideways ROM and then for this one do Star Carnival and it will play Carnival uh, using the, the keys that it's defined there. You can also just star run the game and it will it will run it so you don't need to go through the instructions um, which i think is quite is i've not seen it in other bbc things it's not very important but i did want to be able to put the roms either into a machine um, where you can play them or you can actually because all my games support bbc or master or plus or compact um, you could actually put them into a ROM cartridge and if you put it in slot zero then when you power on it will actually auto boot the game so you can kind of turn it into a turn your master into a cartridge based console if you want so what haven't I talked about I haven't talked about sound my Kelly's heel uh, so I was writing carnival I posted uh, my finished version of the sound. I was very pleased. I was very chuffed that I'd managed to get this tune playing. I'd done it in a small amount of code and a small amount of data, and it sounded great, except everybody said it was wrong. Uh, it was playing the wrong notes in the wrong order, for the wrong lengths, at the wrong speed. You name it, it didn't do a single thing right with the tune. Now, unfortunately, I've got no musical ability whatsoever. So I really couldn't tell that there was anything wrong with it at all. Um, so first of all, well, where do I get the sound from? I have written various converters now, so I can get them from VGM files, which are files that store timestamps and register rights uh, to whichever chip the actual they came from. Uh, so I'll read those from either the same chip as the BBC, the um, SN76489, or the AY38910, which is common in arcade games, and the Spectrum, and the, well, 8912, I guess, in the Vectrex. Um, or I'll hack an emulator that has a, a good version of the tune to dump out basically the same information, but in an easy form for me to read. I'll go to a site called VGM Rips or other similar sites where the people have already pulled out VGM files of the soundtracks. I've been known to, for example, Phoenix, downline MIDI files um, where people have put up free versions of their version of a piece of music um, and wrote converters to convert that to the BBC. Uh, some games like Frogger, I managed to find somebody had done a tracker version of their their idea of Frogger tunes. Well, I didn't realise at the time they're not the same tunes as Frogger, but they fit really well. So uh, I asked them if they'd mind me putting them in the game, and they said no, they were happy for them to be in the game. So there's a if you play Frogger on on uh, BBC Micro over at UK, you'll see there's a credit to them on there. Or I guess you could ask somebody to make a tune for you. Uh, I know that the uh, bit shifters have guys who are quite happy to make tunes for them, although nobody's offered to make one for me yet. Um, maybe one day. Uh, I also, out of desperation on one of the games, wrote a sample to a frequency converter. So you actually give it a sample of the game and it tries to analyze what frequencies are being played when. Um, but as you can imagine, I have. I can't tell if it's right or wrong, so that's a bit tricky. Uh, and then finally on Space Invaders, I got so so annoyed at not being able to get close to the sound um, and people complaining that it actually plays samples in game now uh, for when you shoot and when the aliens explode, which does give it a very pleasing sound. And because there's not much going on screen, you've actually got time to play samples while the game is playing, which isn't really true of pretty much any other game I've written. Uh, so what else do I do? Well, I use Audacity, as you can see from the screenshot, and I actually look at the waveforms of the sound coming out, see if I'm if my waveforms have got the same frequency as those from either a video from an emulator or main, 
or a sound recording of off YouTube or playing it myself in some other kind of emulator. I check to see if the notes are the same length, so are the loud bits the same spec distance apart? And then I scroll through, scroll through the whole, whole tune to see that I haven't missed any notes out or anything. So now when I do this, generally I don't get people going, well, that's the wrong notes in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but it is very, very time consuming. So anything to avoid doing that, I'll do. Um, MAME has a nice feature. You can do minus AVI write, which will write you out a video of your gameplay, which is helpful for reading this in. Uh, there's also a version of MAME, uh, I think it's VGM MAME, which will actually write you out a VGM file. So again, I, that's, that's very handy for writing converter um, to convert to the BBC scan chip. And BBEM will write you out a video as well. I think B2 does videos as now, but as well now, but it doesn't work very well on my system. So I'll, uh, I'll avoid that. Well, I just that tend not to run it. It takes a while to start up on my machine, and generally I like my. So I probably didn't mention this, but my build process is usually between. Well, it's usually around one second to do those four the four things I was talking about before. So it's about two seconds to do that, launch the emulator and be uh, waiting at the splash screen, which makes for quite productive, well, very fast turnaround, which isn't always good for productivity, but usually pretty good. Uh, and then um, graphics and color. So the picture on the left is when I thought I'd finished Carnival finally got the sound working, all the gameplay was working. Well, nearly all the gameplay was working. I'd missed some of the text now, as you can see. Actually, this is from not quite when I thought it was ready. Um, but if you look at the game on the left, you'll say, oh yeah, that looks like a BBC game. Very familiar with its four colors, or well, yeah, black plus three colors. Uh, and this is when Arcadian to the rescue again said, look, can't you get some more color into it? It doesn't look it doesn't look um, doesn't look very good, and I'm thinking, well, the, the whole game's there. Surely that's all people care about. Not that it looks pretty, um, but after some persuading, cajoling, I I did put some more colour into the game. And I think if you look at the one on the right, that that's probably why people say often say that it doesn't look like a BBC game because it's got the resolution of Mode One, but it's got a lot of colours in there. And this game isn't particularly colourful in the arcade, so it's it's not got everything as you might expect. Um, so the, the way I do this is I usually I'll start a, a timer in VSync. Well, what I did for Carnival was start a, a one-shot timer in VSync. And then when you get to the bit where it says pipes, just at the top of the pipes, I'll... Um, I'll swap the magenta for green, changing the palette. Then at the bottom of the pipes, change green and cyan to red and white to draw the tar draw the targets you're shooting at. And then somewhere between the bottom of the targets and the gun, I'll change the red and yellow to cyan and blue. Um, I think there is cyan in the original game, but the blue is cyan as well. So I just changed it to blue so that I could use all the colors on the palette just to in a little bit more color um, and I think really I've carried this through with every other game I've done not just so that people don't say it hasn't got enough color but because it actually does make the games feel quite different um, and hopefully hopefully you agree um, now I don't use a, a one-shot timer and reset it each time I'll use a continuous timer and update the the latched value. So with the one shot, you get a bit of a bit more jitter in each can each subsequent timer. If you're just changing the latched value, then your your timing is rock solid every frame. Um, you could set it to to loop around the entire frame for you know two million cycles. Uh, no, sorry for for one frame's worth of time. Um, but I don't do that because if you mess with the graphics chip, then on the VOSI 6845s, it actually adds an extra character row in and your timing would go wildly out each frame. 
so I don't change that. And that's um, that's pretty much the end, really. Uh, apart from I've just realised that there's a slide missing, but um, so. no, that's okay. Um, yeah, so sorry, I was supposed to tell you when I was ten minutes from the end. But uh, if you've got any questions, that's the oh. link to the various tools I've used. I do have a few questions here for you, Richard. Uh, thanks for that. Excellent. Very interesting. And um, most of the questions are from one person. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will start with that. Um, he says it's, hard, it's from UX Code, which is Kelvin, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, it's highly recognizable that you are doing the tricky bits. That doing the tricky bits is the most fun. After all these years, do you have a library or template of functions like high score table? Right plotting, music player, etc. Uh, no. <laughs> the nearest I've got is my graphics uh, converter, which with every game gets some new type of feature added. Uh, so with Scramble, it was um, reading the write out all of the frames of me playing a level of Scramble convert those stitch those bitmaps back together allowing for the fact that scramble advances one two or three pixels per frame based on random timing and it should be two every frame reconvert those back into a level convert the level into tiles convert the tiles into pairs of tiles and convert those into sprites along with some data to decode them back into stuff to draw um so yeah that that grows with each thing sprite routines some are copy and paste most games I'll just rewrite them every time, so yeah, it's quite it's quite wasteful. Um, high score tables generally I don't put them in because I don't have enough memory left by the time I put the game in. I uh, put them in uh, centipede because I thought it was quite an important part of the game because it sits on the high score table, and I put them in with carnival because it was my first game and. Uh, Part of the, one of the features is you can see your rank change as you as you're playing and you're scoring higher and higher. So sorry, no, I should do more use than I do, but but I do copy and paste the entire code base at the beginning of a new game. So <laughs> it's a bit. Okay, his uh, his next question is: Have you ever considered making tech demos instead of full games? Maybe we keep your focus on solving the tricky bits and avoid the tedious bits. <laughs> yes, but then, um, so that's in fact where Frogger came from. So for Frogger, what I wanted to do was, um, it actually started out as a tech demo of me saying, uh, I want to draw, want to write a game that's going to move the most possible amount of pixels on a on the BBC Micro that any game has ever done, uh, but I only wanted to do it as a tech demo because I couldn't think of a game that it fit. And then I realized that to make it look impressive and have the most things moving, things had to move along a horizontal row, um, a small number, you know, probably up to about three or four pixels per, per frame maximum. Uh, and they could change what was drawing each, each row uh, to make it look like there was more work being done. And then I was kind of playing around with it. And I suddenly realized that this tech demo I was describing was in fact Frogger. Um, so, so for that one, the, the actual game code for Frogger is probably, oh, I don't know, well less than half a K. Um, and then there's about 15 K of unrolled sprite code. <laughs> Or maybe maybe thirteen k or whatever the rest is is graphics. So um, yeah, that that pretty much is a tech demo that just happens to coincide with an arcade game. Yeah, and his next question is: um, Is any of your source code, games and tools, uh, published on GitHub, for instance? Um, if not, is that something you'd consider doing? Uh, it's not posted on GitHub. I don't get on with github i if i ever use it i just do the download complete zip file of the entire thing um i have posted it on stardot 
several, several of my games, the source code's up there, the converters, the compressor, uh, the map editor that I did for, uh, for Spy Hunter, which I haven't written yet, uh, along with all the display code for that. There's various sprite samples um, and libraries that I've done and posted on Stardot. Uh, I did post up all the changes that I made to make um, BM build on Windows without um, a Linux command line. Um, it wasn't very well received because uh, it wasn't really, diffs weren't very easy for anybody to apply. Uh, so yeah, I, I, in general, I don't really get on very well with open source projects on the, on Windows. Uh, I find Java ones work fine. Anything else never builds or wants a million support libraries that it doesn't tell you which version or where to get them from. So on Linux, that's fine. You know, you type whatever command and it, it goes and gets everything for you. On Windows, that doesn't exist, or it wants you to use Python and Git and a load of tools that I don't want to have anything to do with and can't be asked with. I've never written a line of Python and I'm really trying hard not to start now. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, anyone can have the source to any of my games. Um, Steve's comment really is that, that the game launcher looks like the perfect companion for Beejit, which doesn't have a GUI. So, more of a comment than a question. Uh, yeah, if I mean, I yeah, I can't remember if I put the source up for it or not. It's Windows only. Beep, I think is Windows only at the moment. So yeah, at the moment it's it's just a a command line for each one that defaults to just running the SSD with I think BBM because it was old. Um, but yeah, basically it's a text file with a line per game or CSV with a line per game. Um, Xerox Code's next question is, um, have you tried using standard data compression like Eximizer? Uh, I looked at it. It was a bit of a pain. Uh, and the decompressor was massive. And I couldn't get it to... I think it was a pain to build. It needed some other libraries that I didn't have. And I eventually found the right versions. Uh, and then... It's no, I never got it working. I never got it working, but the decompressor was something like four or five hundred bytes, and mine's uh, less than 80 bytes. Um, and I didn't need any more compression, I just needed to fit it into a 16k EPROM. So, no, there's there is a, another one that Kieran found, uh, which looks like a, an excellent one to use. And forgive me, I've forgotten everyone's names. The guy who did the tower defense game and is now doing the, the dungeon game, I think he's now using that. He did a couple of experiments and found out that the decompressor is like a couple of hundred bytes and does nearly as good a job as X, Xmizer. Um, so if I was if I needed something more, I'd use that. But, but generally, I don't, you know, because I load everything into memory. Um, well, I guess I throw the decompressor away anyway as soon as the since I need to change video mode, so it wouldn't matter. Next. <laughs> yeah, um, just a, a comment from Clintworth. Um, love your games, Tricky. Really enjoy playing them on the Stardot High Score Challenge. I like it. <laughs> um, and then Mark, 1024 Mac, um, you mainly target your games at the BBC B. In future, do you have any plans to target Master, one two eight or Compact Systems? Uh, so all my games run on the B, the B+, plus, the Master and the Compact, um, including the various joystick support. Uh, BBC is, is the machine I had back in the day. It's the machine I love, the Model B. Uh, sideways RAM I had back in the day, so I'm quite happy to target that. Um, I, you know, I take a master and a compact with me to shows, but they're not, they're not the BBC to me. So I don't, I don't really want to write stuff that will only work on those. You know, Kieran's doing such an excellent job with Prince of Persia and, and Stunt Car Racer that, I don't think it needs me doing it. There's also a couple of the other guys doing games are uh, master only, or at least, you know, four banks of sideways RAM plus potentially other RAM. Um, so no, I think if it doesn't run on the beep, I'm not really, I'm not interested in it. 
the um, Astro Blaster will use sideways RAM to drive the speech chip if you've if you've got both, or um, the Warlords emulator requires sideways RAM because the original arcade game uses all the first 32K well, by the time I've displayed the screen. So that has to have sideways RAM for the graphics and my code. Uh, one more question from Zurex Code, which um, you, you kind of answered, but uh, do you ever work with others on one of your games, for example, for sound music, etc.? cetera? Uh, not currently. Somebody did offer to do replacement um, sounds for Space, Inv Space Invaders when I was really struggling to get it to sound right. But after, I mean, they are, you know, I wouldn't say professional, they're extremely well-known chiptune um, author. Uh, but after they decided that actually it was not possible to do a better sound, a better shooting sound, um, or, the, or they ran out of time that they were going to spend doing it. I'm not sure which. Um, no, I haven't. I'm happy for anybody to write any kind of sound effects or, or music to go in my games. Um, I mean, generally, I try and convert the arcade game because I want it to sound like that. Well, partly because I want it to sound like that and partly because that's a source of music for it. Like the Frogger one, that was, you know, I didn't go and ask somebody to do that. They'd already done it, and I happened to stumble on it. Um, so that was that was quite fortunate. Um, I guess one question I've got for everyone else is, would you like me to talk in more detail about any of the technical, um, more technical details of what they've done in the game, rather than you know just a timer to change the color here and here? There's nothing terribly exciting, uh, but I did make a couple of lists in case we didn't have enough questions. I have a question, which is, um, you know, do you have a list of other tricky things to do already made up, or is that something that just you just occurs to you in the, in the middle of the night? I have a list of other games that I'm that I haven't ruled out, uh, which is I think currently about sixty odd <laughs> games. Is Paradroid on there? Sorry? Is Paradroid on there? I don't know that one. Oh, oh I did look at it. Yeah, that's an that's Archimedes game, isn't it? Or C64 game. So it's not an arcade game anyway. So my, my, my real love is from the early 80s arcades. So from about 80 to 82. Um, I did used to go to the arcades quite a lot after that, but pretty much... I don't think I played any games that weren't 10 p ago. So, and then when I worked in the arcade game in the arcades, I did actually got free play on um, like uh, Space Ace and the holographic game. I can't remember what it was called. And iRobot. I think somebody should do iRobot for the Archimedes, if not for the BBC. Um, I think Dave has a question or a comment you'd like to make. Well, yeah, not really a question. I got a uh, name check quite a lot, <laughs> lot through there. I, 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 can't can't be I can't believe I'd have ever said that Carnival looked or didn't look very good in four colours. But I do remember pushing for that final sixth colour. I think it was the green in the middle of the high, you know, the high, the green used for the high score. <laughs> so I do remember nagging you for that for a month or so. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think you ever said it looked rubbish without it, but I think you did say that it definitely needed more. Yeah. Um, that would be on that would be on retro software. Uh, actually, a bit I missed out about that is well, the, the the only colors I couldn't get into it were the pipes on the arcade game have got um, four colors on the pipes: red, white, green, and cyan. Um, but because you've also got to have a background color, that will be five. So, uh, and since they do appear on the same scan line, yeah, I I couldn't get them in for that particular game. Uh, but I also, for custom graphics converters, wrote code that took every frame of the pipes and every frame of the bears uh, and generated um, code to draw them as fast as possible using as little memory as possible. So it looked for repeated patterns. So the pipes, when they're horizontal, doesn't matter whether the flag's on the left or the right, there's a vertical, there's a horizontal stripe. And the actual block on the end, the flag bit on the end is the same. And same with the diagonals kind of top left bottom right uh, and the bears have got solid sections and duplicated feet 
things. So. Which is your proudest achievement out of all of your 8-bit conversions? Oh, that is a very hard one. I mean, I've got a few things that I really like. Um, speech in Astro Blaster. Um, the Frogger, just the sheer amount of stuff moving and the fact that it's it goes between about 19 and a half and 20.1 milliseconds to draw that stuff. So it's absolutely packed every cycle available. Um, scramble, because the uh, the two pixel software scrolling landscape um, so I think it was Rich Tobert Watkins said it couldn't be done, which was, you know, so it had to be done then because that's, you know, if something Rich says can't be done, can be done, then then you've done a, you know, you've actually achieved something. So uh, I really like that because people look at it and, well, some, some people appreciate that it's really hard to do on the BBC. Uh, and then some people look at it and go, oh, it's just scrolling landscape. That was done back in the day. Um, and um, I guess finally the Space Invaders, the um, the shooting, you know, playing samples while the game's running so that you get the right shooting sound and the right uh, alien explosion. Um, oh, and I guess uh, maybe one more, which is coming up with the little uh, electronic circuit to let you have uh, four player warlords. So you can have four Atari panels and everyone gets a fire button. Um, not really a feature of the game, but uh, but I'm yeah very pleased with with that little trick of electronics. Although I do realise now that it was the the same one that the joysticks that have the sixteen fire buttons or you know the little numeric keypad on them. It's actually the same trick they use, um, but obviously I didn't know that when I did it. So yeah, not one, but four or five <laughs> favourite bits of technology anyway. I think that's, uh, that's it. Thanks very much, Richard. That was uh, very interesting. I've got a big chunk of text to dump in the chat, if that's okay. Absolutely fine. I'll, I'll have to turn that on. I can't, I can't think where else to put it. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a, a list of games and the things that I think are interesting about them. Uh, if anybody ever does want uh, a presentation about any of them, or just want to ask me about how I did the various bits, uh, they're in there.